Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. The most successful show of this season is the revival of the 1949 musical South Pacific. And we're really happy to have with us now the guy who's totally responsible for this fabulous production. Uh, now, you might think we have Richard Rogers here or <laughs> oh, Oscar oh, Hammerstein, no. perhaps. Okay, okay. Uh, but they weren't available uh, for our <laughs> South Pacific show. So uh, we've settled for someone who's just as talented, just as good. The wonderful director, Bartlett Cher, who has given us a really handsome production of South Pacific at Lincoln Center, uh, following up on your great success with Adam Gettle's musical Light in the Piazza that you also directed and Awake and Sing that you directed for Lincoln Center. So welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. Thanks. Great to be here. Uh, now I got to ask you first though about your um, your uh, Emile de Beck in this production. Mm -hmm. Someone that we, none of us in the theater have ever seen before. Uh, Paulo Schott, I believe his name is. That's right. Fabulous. I mean really uh, rivals I think Ezio Pinza. How did you come across Paulo Schott? Um, well, uh, it was sort of a long process. Uh, we have Bernie Telsey casting, and they were the people who did La Boheme, so they were familiar with, with the, the opera. opera world. Okay. Uh, they had to look everywhere. We actually interviewed and talked to many, many, many very famous bass baritones, many of whom wouldn't do it because of tax reasons or um, <laughs> what do you, what do you money. Or, tax reasons? Because you don't want to spend more than a certain number of days in the United States, or, you pay or else you have to pay taxes, so you're not going to come and stay that long. Um, maybe didn't want to work that many days in a row. I don't yeah, know, yeah, a lot yeah. of reasons. Yeah. Uh, and we auditioned people from all over the world, really. Mm -hmm. And Paolo walked in, and he was, of course, incredibly handsome well, and, and beautiful. So, so handsome. He, I thought he was, I was worried he was a little too young, except that the real story, in the real story, um, uh, De Beck is only 44, and when Pinza did it, they, they sort of <laughs> they elevated the age a bit, and changed the story a bit. <laughs> and we were just, you know, incredibly lucky to have him. He's Where is a, he from? He is from Brazil, but he's actually um, Polish. His family emigrated from Poland to Brazil, where he was raised. Now, any concerns, though, uh, directing opera singers? Because opera singers not, are not all known for their great acting chops. I mean, that must have been a very a key issue for you to find someone who can act a musical theater yeah, role. Yeah, different kind of acting. I think the big concern between Paolo and I was that when he wasn't singing. Because in, in opera, the music controls the action. Yeah. So you feel this thing sort of pulling you along. And then he... You could tell early on that he was in a, his big effort was to kind of transition into actually speaking and feeling comfortable, and that took a long time. But like anything, he just got better and better and better and better and better, and and now he's you know he's wonderful. Yeah, I mean he's a, he's a really really fine 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 actor. The other thing they do, the other thing he does incredibly well is he's he's very good at putting what a lot of leading men don't know to do is put all the focus on your partner Kelly O'Hara. Kelly, and they're both really uh, have a great chemistry together, and so they're both good at that. Is South Pacific something that a show that you've always wanted to? direct or did Lincoln Center come to you and say would you take a step I really think you know I think the the person who's the most responsible for it and is the most for whom it's the greatest passion is Andre Bishop the head of Lincoln Center he's always wanted to do it and when we were even in the middle of Light in the Piazza he had talked to me about the possibility of approaching Rogers and Hammerstein finally and if I was interested in doing it I went back and read it again I have I had never seen it Really? I have to admit. No, have you seen the movie seen. or the I'd seen, indifferent I'd movie? I'd begun but... the movie. Yeah. I don't remember actually finishing <laughs> okay. it, so I hadn't seen it. Um, went back and re read it, and in reading it, I was, you know, found it incredible. Mm -hmm. And I, very relevant, and it was this very similar experience to Awake and Sing, going back to it, thinking one thing about it, and then reading it and going, this is not at all what I imagined So what it was. changed in your, your what, 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 what did you find in it? Yeah. Yeah, what what did you um, find? Well, the, the thing was, is it, I think I was probably most attracted to Josh Logan's world. Uh, having just come out of Awake and Sing, I was interested in his, 
devotion to the Moscow Art Theater, his studying with Stanislavski, and how he was really a man of real deep realism. Mm. So you could read in the text the opportunity to explore the real heart of the work and the writing, and you could feel that, and you could feel their exploration of racism and all these things in it that were deeply real against this music. And I, from my point of view, the, the, the connection to that was what was so impressive. It's, it's a very good point because, uh, like, like uh, the two of you, I really was, I was familiar with the music, but not so much the show. Yeah. And I was struck by the um, context of Happy Talk. Yeah. Because you hear, you know, you know it's like a nice little Roger and Hammerstein ditty. Happy talk, keep talking, happy talk. Talk about things you like to do. And then when it's done that Bloody Mary's trying to prostitute her daughter Correct. to Lieutenant Cable, happy talk suddenly takes on a much darker right. shade to it. And what we know is, you know, third world poverty when it encounters a first world sort of universe, there's a desperate need to get out of that poverty. Yeah. So she's willing to go to any lengths. And the other thing that was weird about seeing, was looking back down the sort of corridor of time toward the show, you, you know, between it is Korea and Vietnam yeah. and Iraq. So all these other experiences of, without sounding too political, imperial engagements abroad, and our experience of that affected how you could look at South Pacific now. Mm -hmm. So you look at cable differently through the lens of post-traumatic stress. You look at the characters and the desperation of where they are. You look at how different we were. All these things were resonating as I read it, and I thought, well, it may be good, especially when we're in a kind of chaotic time as a country, to renew how you feel about who we were and how artists approach that and look at who we are now and see what kind of things could And, and I also, I had a conversation with somebody about the, the racism thing that someone said to me, well, why would Nellie want to not be with him just because his children are black? Not realizing, no, no, but not realizing the depth of the racism of of that time. Yeah, and we're we're in the middle of it now. Yeah, and, oh, we I was, are. I was yeah. lucky enough to, you know, Roger Hamilton gave me the original scripts they had, so I did take a couple of pages of stuff that they cut in '48. Mm. Mm. So you hear words like colored, which you didn't hear in the original script. Mm. Uh, in the original production and, and other things with Cable talking about I couldn't bring her home because if we had a housewarming nobody would come. Oh, things good. That would, yeah. That's all restored in and the script. And you restored My Girl Back Home, right? My Girl yeah, Back Home, yeah. which I moved from the second act yeah, to the first yeah, act. Yeah. But all of that really allowed me to know that I could explore the scenes and they would release into the songs beautifully. And frankly, I'm a big fan of American theater artists and I think that they were exploring very serious and incredible things and connecting it to musicals. and you know, there are sort of ancestors, and, and that's a, something I feel good about doing, you know, as a classicist, sort of. Yeah. Uh, having seen your production the other night, I had sent me running to the bookstore to pick up Michener's book, Tales yeah. of the South Pacific. Yeah. Did you begin there when yeah. you began thinking about this book? I read the, reread the book um, partly because, well, and to be astonished by what Hammerstein and Logan did with the book, but uh, uh, because that language is such a great, you know, sort of fairy tale beginning and connective tissue. And it bookends your production. You begin with yeah. a screen with the uh, opening paragraphs yeah. of Michener's work. Yeah, and again, I was trying to find those links of certain kinds of American artists and American voices, and his voice is very much behind the whole story, the way he captures a Bloody Mary or a Billis or a you know, even a bracket, all those sort of, that world is very much his, mm. his descriptions, his filling that in, and then the, you know, Hammerstein, Logan, and Rogers capturing them. And his very recent experience, because wasn't Michener... He was there. He was there, yeah. He was there, and he, he really had that experience of what we call Bally Highness. Yeah. You know, you go <laughs> to a foreign place, you get your head blown open, and you get transformed by this experience of being abroad, and these kids, you know, Americans waking up to a whole world they had no idea was there. Now, with the, with, with, South Pacific, you've, you've put together kind of a nice, if you will, Bartlett Share company of, uh, yeah. <laughs> of actors and designers. Yeah. Kelly O'Hara and Matthew yeah. Morrison were both in um, Piazza. Light and Piazza, and you've used the same designer. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, sorry, two, his name two, is... uh, Kathy Zuber, Michael Jurgen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, is this going to be the Bartlett Share team from, as you move from you show know, to show? I, I, yeah, I mean, I'd like it to be, in the sense that, uh, you know, for me, the best experience would be Kelly and a Shakespeare next, hmm. you know, or or to, to, you know, Kelly and Danny and Paolo and Shakespeare next. The thing is, is that I, I find that uh, theater deepens with a kind of extended experience. So working with the same people over and over again, I get better. 
You know, I get more connected. I like that kind of family. And, and so I do like to stay with the same people. I wonder where you're de you and in your designer picks up. The, the way it would, only having seen Light in the Piazza and this, the beautiful design, but the, the thinking in the design, which your staging yeah. feeds into, and, and it's just, you're working together. Well, you have the advantage way. of the Beaumont, but the, yeah. the, the nature of space, we could have a whole program about, the way space well, can expand Well, say a little about contract. what you've done with the space there. Yeah, you know, you take a space like the Beaumont, which is the only place you can make a movie and a musical at the same time, because it's so big. <laughs> yeah. And you can, you can expand it and contract it, so it's basically a large beach with one palm tree. Uh, and a lot of old-fashioned things, like real painted drops and back painted drops for Valley High and things like that. I don't go so much in for projection type things. But you can close down and expand the space a lot. And we pull the deck back to reveal the orchestra. Yes. And you get a huge round of yeah. applause. Yeah. Round of applause. Yeah. Who sees an orchestra of how many uh, people in it? 30 people. 30 and people. Uh, you know, in, in discussing with Andre, it was like, this, is, this it helps people learn how to listen. Yeah. It helps yes. them learn to appreciate. Because otherwise, they sit in this weird in-between place with them all tucked under the and deck. And there's this canned and sound coming. Yeah. Yeah, and also to make it as acoustic a sound as possible. And sometimes I say it's like an analog experience in a digital world. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, this, this experience of, of South Pacific. Because when you really get inside the real sound of it, it actually operates physically on you differently. Yes, and they're opening their mouths and it's like they're singing. Yeah, and actually where the sound is coming from is where the person happens to I know, be. It's a, it, it <laughs> is, it's a remarkable experience sitting through yeah. it. I thought that too, because I've seen a couple of other Broadway shows lately, which must remain nameless, and you see the people that are talking, and the voice is coming from but, over uh, there. It's a big part of what Andre is committed to, yeah. you know, really, really making sure the sound feels that way. I've worked at the Metropolitan Opera, where yeah. you have that kind of experience, and it's irreplaceable, that stuff. Adam Gettle's the same way about it, really making sure you can really actually hear it. Like our sits probe for, for South Pacific was That's literally the first time, the orchestra the first time we all sit down to reading we're in a room. It's literally emotionally and physically overwhelming to be that close to those instruments and hear those voices and have that happen. And you want the audience to have the same experience. And people go, well, it's so emotional. Well, after enough time with that rich a sound that comes from deep in some American psychic place, mm -hmm. you really begin to open up and find yourself connecting up, you know, to being an American, to being a part of a tradition, to being a part of a theater going tradition, the whole thing kind of falls into sequence. And that's, I just want to shepherd that. I just want to be responsible to that kind of tradition. Well, uh, it's a terrific production of South Pacific at Lincoln Center, directed by Bartlett Chair. What, what are you going on to do next? I'm going to Salzburg, Austria, to direct Romeo et Juliet. <gasps> oh, the good the opera. Right? Yes, in the same space that the Sound of Music finishes at the end of the mu movie. Oh, <laughs> you just Very can't strange. get away from. Oh, I know. No, no it's really beautiful. It's going to be kind of fun. It's you know, it's kind of a big adventure. And oh yeah, it'd be great. We'll see. Yeah. Well, All good right. luck with that. Thanks. All right. Good to talk to you. Thanks for being our guest tonight. Thank you. There is nothing like a day. We are going to talk about South Pacific, its history, and the original production tonight on Theatre Talk. And we are joined tonight by Don Fellows, who was an original cast member of the Broadway production in 1949, and Ted Chapin, our old friend who is the president of the Rogers and Hammerstein organization. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, now, Don, 50 years ago, can you take us back and just tell us what the opening night of the original production of South Pacific on Broadway was like? Well, it was, in the first place, it was very interesting because in all honesty, we didn't know what we had. Really? And we knew that we were uh, bound to be successful uh, because up in Boston, for instance, people started to ask. I remember in a store uh, next door to the theater, he said, uh, he said, if you can get me a pair of tickets, uh, I'll give you a hundred dollars. <laughs> and I thought, is this guy crazy? Uh, did you take him up on his offer? No, 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 <laughs> because I was very suspicious. Mm. And so anyway, so we came into town, and I remember opening night, the curtain went up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And Tommy Gleason was standing next to me. and, and A fellow looked, cast member. Yeah, and we looked at each other, and we said, they're crazy. <laughs> they're crazy. We had absolutely no idea of the impact. 
But surely you must have known. Uh, you know uh, the, the songs are standard. So so many oh, from that show. Oh, yeah, you must have known back then wonderful. when you've heard. What was it like to hear "Some Enchanted Evening" oh, for the first God. time? Uh, thrilling is all I can say. Yeah. Plus the fact that because it came out of the rehearsal milieu, <laughs> if I can be a little fancy, <laughs> a little uh, arty. <laughs> uh, and as I and 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 as I said last night, the astonishing thing was to all of us that Pinzik could not read music. He couldn't read London Bridges Falling Down. Oh he, he was very nervous in Boston one afternoon, and we couldn't figure out why. And the man had come up to see the show that taught him Boris Gudinoff and Don Giovanni and everything else. Yeah, because pink, 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 <laughs> pink, 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 <laughs> pink on the piano. <laughs> and so they, had a, they started to have a run through of the music. And uh, uh, Trudy Rittman, who is the accompanist, said, all right, Mr. Pinza, uh, I'll give you a G chord. And he said, no, no, stop, stop, stop. Give me the note. <laughs> and so she played the thing and then went ping, ping, ping. And then this glorious voice. Because this was Athea Pinza, who was a star of the Metropolitan of the Opera. Metropolitan Opera. Years, and this was his first musical. And he Soul was... Musical. And, and it was, we used to stand in the wings and marvel when he sang Some Enchanted Evening because I swear we could feel it in our feet. Some enchanted evening. You could, you, you could feel a vibration. He was, he was, we used to think he had batteries uh, <laughs> because that was long before the days when you're mic like this. <laughs> right. As Roz said, we had voices then. Yeah, right. And good, you good learned point. to project. Very good and, point. Right. Uh, Ted, I want to ask you, what was going on in Rodgers and Hammerstein's their lives and, and their career at this point, that they came together to write South Pacific? Well, it was their, their fourth show. Um, Oklahoma and Carousel, obviously, had been wildly successful. So and they were really at the top of their game. Well, no, they weren't. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's important that, that they, Oklahoma hit the, the town by, took the town by storm. They followed it up with, with Carousel, which everybody felt was artistically extraordinary, perhaps superior to Oklahoma, but certainly of an artistic nature, perhaps approaching American opera. Mm -hmm. Then they did their original musical, Allegro, which absolutely crash-landed. Right. Um, although one of the original cast members of South Pacific took umbrage at my reference to the fact that it was a great failure. He said, it's a great show. I said, it is a great show, but it was a failure. <laughs> yeah, right. And it was, I think it must have been a kind of an embarrassing failure because it, had, it was very worthy with a lot of very, very good ideas in it, but it simply didn't work as a show. Mm -hmm. And they, I think much in the way that when Steve Sondheim and Hal Prince wrote a little night music, they needed a hit. Right. They nice. needed a hit. Because if they hadn't done a hit, then it would have been, you know, two shows, one, and then who knows. Right, right. And, you know, they took on, with Josh Logan, a formidable collaborator. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it, one of the extraordinary things about South Pacific is that, you know, everybody was slightly intimidated by everybody else, mm -hmm. but at the same time inspired by everybody else, and that's why the show is as extraordinary. I mean, I can understand why from the cast standpoint, it was another show, but boy, what was going on. Behind with, the scenes. Oh, was, you know. Did and, they all get along? Did Roger and Hammerstein work well with Josh Logan? Or was there, you know, tension with the, be, uh, among these titans? Did you ever see any of that in the re rehearsal? A little. He did say, little. Yeah, I he did say it's a, oh, <laughs> Richard but, but Rogers something. was clearly the boss. Oh, really? And, and, I, and I had worked for Josh. My first job was in Mr. Roberts as an extra, where Josh was king. Mm. And, and, and we noticed a little bit during rehearsals, because Rogers was there a lot, uh, and uh, Josh would be directing some, something, and then and uh, Mr. Rogers would sit in the in the rear of the theater, and then we would hear only occasionally we we'd hear Josh, Josh, may I have a minute? And Logan would trot up the aisle, and they'd talk and talk and talk and talk and then Josh would come down and say well no I think what we're gonna do is gonna... <laughs> but it didn't happen often but it was clearly that uh, that Rogers knew what he wanted and where was Oscar Hammerstein in, in this mix he 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 didn't come there was an old story that he didn't even have a desk in the office because if he had a desk <laughs> he'd have to come to the office <laughs> is that true? Uh, I think it is <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, he was uh, he he was there and and I remember uh, particularly the day that they brought in uh, Younger Than Springtime because they had, as they said last night, there was, there was a song 
uh, called Suddenly Lucky that went yeah. suddenly lucky, right. suddenly da da <laughs> dee da da, which turned up again. <laughs> right. yes. You don't waste anything. Right. And uh, they came in, and uh, Mr. Hammerstein croaked. And uh, Rogers Crump played. Yes, he, yeah, he, 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 he didn't. Yeah, right. yes. yo, yo, younger than springtime, mm -hmm. and and we fell apart. Mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and Josh told told a wonderful story later because he did live longer, so he could tell mm -hmm. of how the, the first song that they wrote for for that for Lieutenant Cable was a song called My Friend, and it was very sweet. Mm -hmm. And Logan said that. He heard it and he thought, "This is the worst song I've ever heard in my life." And he thought, "Well, I, you know, I was gr brought up to be a good, you know, Southern boy, but I have to say what I think." And he said, "I said to Rogers and Hammerstein, that's the worst song I've ever heard in my life." And they got very huffy and stormed out. And he said, "You know, uh -oh. gee, they are Rogers and Hammerstein, and maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have said it that way." And then he thought, "You know what? To hell with them. Let them go write another <laughs> song." <laughs> well, One of the big Lieutenant Cable songs was. You've got to be carefully taught, which right. was, a, a, at the time, wasn't quite controversial confrontation Sorry. of racism. Yeah, and it was interesting because the cast was asked, what was it like being on stage while this controversial song was being sung in part of the show? And their answer was, it's just another song in the show. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people. People your relatives hate You've got to be carefully taught You've got to be carefully taught We weren't that conscious of any yeah. big deal. Yeah, yeah. And that's for historians, I think, to read, read a lot into But that. also, I mean, I, I do think part of the genius of, of South Pacific is the character who sings that song is Lieutenant Cable, who is the northern liberal character mm. who cannot get over his own prejudice. Right, it's right. the southerner from Little Rock who, who is, does. Right. Yeah. So, you know, well, he's... That's a fairly sophisticated reading, uh, though, of, of the currents in American history. Yeah, but that's why, that's why it's 50 years old and we're still it's talking about it. And our, so. our friend Ethan Morden wrote in his Rogers and Hammerstein book that Lieutenant Cable therefore had to die because he could not transcend his racism, in, thematically speaking. In fine, dramatic construction, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, now, Ted, uh, in the Rogers and Hammerstein canon, uh, in terms of the uh, number of times the show has been performed around the world, the amount of revenue is generated for your organization, where does South Pacific uh, fall in the pecking order? It's, it's, it's probably third behind Oklahoma and the sound of music which mm -hmm. are still the ones that are done you know more often in high schools and on up mm -hmm. um, it and right now it's among other places that's playing as we speak is Japan which might seem peculiar because mm -hmm. the, you know certainly the enemy as depicted <laughs> right, in the play right, are the right, Japanese right but uh, I mean it, it it has not, though, had a full-scale Broadway revival, and I think it's the only one of the top r and shows that hasn't. Is there something in the works? Are you uh, working behind the scenes to uh, get South Pacific back to, uh, to Broadway? I think it is absolutely due for one. It's got to be cast well and yeah, directed well. And, and do you think it still holds? Does it hold up well now for, for yes, an audience I think It's going to have to be rethought the way a lot of the shows have been sort of revised by young directors. Now. My sense of it, especially after having gone through th this week and the various activities about the 50th anniversary, is the fact what South Pacific is it is a play it is a musical play mm. and if you start tarting it up for example there's no choreography in it mm. to speak of all the choreography is directed by a director Josh was marvelous um, because he was really a Stanislavski and director he had studied with Stanislavski but and he tried to bring as much Stanislavski and teaching to the commercial theater as he could mm. That's why I told the thing about where it, they had never heard of giving each, each of the guys who were veterans $25 and said, go to the local Army and Navy surplus and buy the clothes you would wear. And that was part of the impact. Right. You talk about impact. These were guys that walked out. Yeah. Um, and so in this number, this number grew. But the management didn't know how, how to repeat it. So whenever there was a road company, we would be hired for the day and assign the person going to the road com company, and we would rehearse him to show him what he did. Ah, oh, I see. Because it. nobody knew. It, it was never... Well, you couldn't write it down. Uh, South Pacific, 50 years. We are looking forward to uh, a Broadway revival soon, I hope, Ted. We hope. Don Fellows, an original cast member. You now live in England. Uh, right. thank, thanks London. for coming in today. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. And Ted Chapin, president of the Rogers and Hammerstein organization. Thanks.
Thank you, as always. Thank you. And now, how great to be able to end with Ezio Pinza and Mary Martin, some enchanted evening. We'll see you next time on Theatre Talk. Good night. Some enchanted evening When you find your true love When you feel her call you Across a crowd